So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Math 115. I hope you had a good exam. <laughs> I hope you had an exam that was not too bad, at least. Um, so that was yesterday. I'll put the next assessment on here really quickly. The next assessment is going to be... Not the final. There, we have one or two more quiz. Uh, one more quiz, I think. Yeah, we have exam three. Okay, we have one more quiz. That is going to be on Tuesday, November 29th. Is that okay? Is that is that a wait? What is that? Like the week before exams. That's four days. Maybe it's not. Throw it out. I'm getting a little. Something all excited. Wait, you're not going to study all of fall break, are you? You're not that type of guy. I know you're not. Tell you what. Um. Wait. When is dead week? Is that supposed to? Is, is that dead week? dead week? That is dead week. Yeah. Because then the last day of classes is December the seventh. Question: What's dead week? Oh, so there's like a week before finals where you're not supposed to give like quizzes. Um, but I don't know when if that's the correct week or not. Okay, what if we did something like this? On that Tuesday, we'll have a partner quiz. Something like that. Or a group work quiz. No, yeah. <laughs> Part, partner being like up to four people in a group. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Okay, and it'll count for all of your quiz grades, so should be a, a good buffer for you all. Um, oh, regarding, uh, regarding next week. Wait, first let me, okay, so first let me put quiz seven. Group quiz on November 29th. So really, it'll be more like a worksheet that you can work on during class, at the end of class, and uh, yeah. So that's going to be on November 29th, which is a Tuesday. Regarding the holiday break, we have a decision to make as a class regarding class on Tuesday, November 22nd, which is the day before break. Well, here's what I can't do. What I can't do is cancel class. Um, what I can do is say, if everyone agrees, and it has to be unanimous between the entire class, Oh, did you say that like an English accent? <laughs> okay, if everyone agrees, I will um, make Tuesday class remote. By which I mean remote and asynchronous. So what I would do is I would post a video onto the YouTube channel, and that would be how you participate in class for that day. So if you want to do that, great. I'm going to assume that so far most people want to. But I understand that nobody wants to be the one who is going to, uh, to, to um, say, I'd rather meet in person. And if there is even one person who wants to meet in person, we will meet in person. So if, obviously, you probably don't want to identify yourself if you're that person. So you can use the anonymous survey on my um, on the blackboard, okay? If you go to course content, which by the way, any of you can fill this out for anything else. If you want to provide anonymous feedback, you can click this link and it will go to this Google form and you can write something here anonymously. It's not going to connect your, or it's not going to collect your uh, email address or anything. So if you want to say, hey, I signed up for an in-person class, in-person class is what I want, then you can put that here and we will have in-person class on Tuesday. So can we just assume that nobody wants in-person class? Until you send out an email. Well, look, I will send an email like on 
Sunday, probably, saying whether or not. But yes, un if, as soon as I get a response, I will say that, yeah, we're having in-person class. But if I don't get a response, I will say the deadline will be like this coming Sunday. OK? All right, regardless, we don't have any quizzes or exams. So if you really wanted to just make your plans now to not be here on Tuesday, you can always watch the recording. Um, but if you're going to be here and we have in-person class, I guess you might as well come. OK, um, any questions on that? OK, so if you want in-person class on Tuesday, use the anonymous survey to let me know. And also, if you want to use the anonymous survey for anything else, like let me know something that's going well in class or something that's not going well in class, then also use it for that. Tom's, well, <laughs> that kind of comment is not preferred. <laughs> OK, so today's class, we're going to talk about section 5.1 and 5.2. So we're going to get back into this trigonometric identity business. And we're going to have a good amount of group work today, I hope. So uh, your next homework is going to be homework 5.1, uh, which is coming soon. I haven't decided when it's going to be due yet. Coming soon. I guess, I mean, I have to make it due after the break, probably. So whatever. 5.1 and 5.2 will be due. Well, 5.1 for sure will be due after the break. And 5.2 soon after that. Because we probably won't finish 5.2 today. So I have office hours today. And I have not graded all of the exams, but the first page of the exam is graded, and... And I did terrible on the exam. Look, as I expected, this exam covers, like, the harder material from the course. The first half of the course is significantly easier than the second half. So the first two exams are all on the first half of the course. Last exam and the final also cover this really difficult material. So it's not, not going to surprise me whatsoever to see a bit of a drop in the, uh, in the average for this coming exam. So if you are worried about that or you took the exam and you didn't feel too good about it, now's the time to start coming to office hours and start putting in a lot of effort in order to sort of get yourself back on track for the final. Okay, so if you just keep doing what you're doing and your exam three doesn't turn out so well, there's a good chance that your final won't turn out so well either. So what you need to do is have some kind of intervention with your studying and do something new. The best possible thing you can do for yourself is to put yourself in LeConte 102 this afternoon from 2.30 to 4 or any of the other days that I have office hours, okay? You will get so much more out of studying with me than you will studying on your own. I promise. So please come to office hours if you feel like you need that. Okay. Uh, any administrative questions before we start in on content for today? Um, oh, oh, okay, never mind. I'm going to pass out the quizzes from last time that I forgot to pass out during group work. Your exams, I will grade them, and I'll have them into Blackboard this weekend, <coughs> return to you on Monday. Deal? I said I'm going to grade, I'm going to grade the exams over the weekend, and I'm going to give them back to you on Monday. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Or there wasn't even a first question, so I don't know why I'm saying other questions, but okay. All right, then let's talk about trigonometric identities. So we know all of these ones. I know all of these ones, and I want you all to know them too. So uh, these ones are the reciprocal identities. They tell you how to go between cosecant and sine, right? And then secant and cosecant. Those are the ones that are kind of confusing, right? Because you think cosecant, what, doesn't that go with cosine? But no, it doesn't. It goes with sine. And then there's cotangent is 1 over tangent and vice versa. 
Then we have the quotient identities. Um, okay, so just how to write tan and cotangent in terms of sine and cosine. And the Pythagorean identities. Okay, so uh, these ones are coming from those three triangles that we can draw, which we did way back in the day. And then we have the even and odd identities. I mean, I don't even know if I would call this an identity so much as a property of the function. Sine is an odd function. Cosine is an even function. Tangent is an odd function. And so all of the reciprocals will also have the same even or oddness. Okay, also have the same even or oddness. So these are the trig identities which we are going to say take for granted. We've proved them. We proved most of them in class, or else we've been given them in class as a definition. So these are the ones that we know to be true. And we're going to use these, this knowledge of these identities in order to evaluate the truth value of other statements about trigonometry. Okay, so we're going to say, like, this is my uh, encyclopedia of what I know to be true. What I don't know to be true is something weird looking like this. I don't know whether that is true. So what are we going to do? If our goal is to disprove, we only need to find a single x value such that if you plug it in here, 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 you get something which is not equal to one another, okay? If you can just find a single x value for which the identity is identity is not true, then you can disprove it. What were some of the methods that we learned on how to verify if an identity is in fact true? How would we show that this identity is true? <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start on one side and transform it into the other side. Okay, that's the goal. I'm going to start with one side and transform it into the other side. Or I'm going to manipulate both sides simultaneously and try to basically reduce this over time. And then at the end, after I do lots of reducing and moving around from left to right and simplifying, then I will get something like an identity which I know to be true already. Okay, So if I can simplify, 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 and then I get something like this, which I know is true because it's part of my encyclopedia of true results, then I can say, well, this is true, and this is the same thing as this, and this is the same thing as this, and this is the same thing as this, and this is the same thing as this. So all of them are true. Does that make sense? OK, so doing that process comes down to one of these three methods. OK, we can start on what we perceive to be the more complicated side and try to leave the other side alone. And then I'm going to try to transform the left-hand side or the right-hand side, whichever one's more complicated, into the other side. The second one is to try to reduce the equality into a known identity, which kind of two and three actually kind of go together, to be honest. Um, so these are your other, other methods that you can do. Or maybe at the end you get something like sine of x is equal to sine of x. You know, something like this which you know to be true. Okay? So you have to reduce the entire thing into something that you know is true. So let's see. Uh, okay, one, one method that I passed over that is useful for this sometimes, well often I guess, is to translate everything into sine and cosine. So let's say I want to simplify this expression, which says cotangent plus tangent plus cosecant times secant. I'm going to rewrite everything in terms of sines and cosines, and then just write everything like this. So this is somehow a little friendlier. Uh, actually, it gets even more friendly because this is just 1, right? So uh, then we get this. So this is a little bit friendlier than the original expression that we had, especially because 
my peanut brain likes sine and cosine. It does not like cotangent and cosecant and secant. Those numbers are confusing to me. But these numbers I'm more familiar with, or these functions I'm more familiar with. So that's why it's sometimes useful to do that. Um, so like we said, disproving comes down to the following. We can do two things. We can find an x value for which the identity is false. So this time we tried just plugging in 0. But the problem with that is if you pick an x value and plug it in, and it ends up being true, that is not enough to say that the identity is verified, is it? Because there could be any number of other x values which might not work. So in order to prove it, okay, you have to say it's true for every x value. But of course, you can't check every x value. So what are you going to do? You're going to reduce it into a known identity, which can be proven using other methods like geometry or something like that. Okay. All right, so uh, you can do that. You can find an x value for which the identity is false, or you can reduce the equality to an absurdity. Okay, So the reduction to the absurd is what is called proof by contradiction in, uh, in mathematics. So here we just rewrote, 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 and eventually we got cosine of x is equal to sine of x. And that's clearly not true. OK, so you can do it that way as well. Any questions on what we've done so far vis-a-vis -vis disproving their uh, identities? I say identities because they're, a, they're like a proposed identity, but they're not an identity because they're false. They would be an identity if it was true. And then verifying identities where we transform one side into the other. Any questions on that so far? OK, then I'm going to do an example problem, and then we're going to do partner practice. OK, so one of the skills, and this I do believe this is a skill, that is going to be very helpful to you when you're doing these kinds of math problems, or if you go on to a proof-based mathematics course, it's a skill that's very useful in proof-based mathematics. The skill is not being afraid to try and fail, OK? Because like Edison said, if you try and you fail, you haven't, you haven't done nothing, right? You have found a way that doesn't work, right? And that's going to be useful, right? There, you have lots of different options here. I could start by trying to work on this side, right? I could say, uh, I got some kind of square things going on here. Maybe a Pythagorean identity is going to work for me. In particular, tan squared plus 1, I can change that into secant squared. Or you could say, well, maybe I'll start on this side, because this looks like maybe I could combine these two by getting a common denominator. And uh, when I get the common denominator, since this is like 1 minus this thing and 1 plus this thing, it's going to be like, it's going to work out nicely. OK, so you get the idea. So let's start maybe on the left-hand side. And I'm just choosing that completely arbitrarily. OK, um, so let's start on the left-hand side. So what am I going to do? I'm going to multiply this side by 1 plus sine x and 1 plus sine x. And then this side, I'm going to multiply by 1 minus sine x and 1 minus sine x. So then I get 1 plus sine x minus now, I need to subtract this whole numerator, so I'm going to put it in parentheses, and that becomes 1 minus sine x, all being divided by, when I FOIL this, the middle terms will cancel because I have a minus and a plus. Okay, I have a minus and a plus, so the middle terms will cancel, and I'll be left with 1 minus sine squared x. Yes? 
and equals to the right hand side, which I have not changed yet. So then I'm going to just rewrite this whole thing again by simplifying the numerator on the left hand side. Uh, 1 minus 1 cancel each other. And I'm left with 2 sine of x over 1 minus sine squared of x. 1 minus sine squared of x. And uh, I'm going to now, well, let me ask you all, how can we go from here? We've done a decent amount of simplifying on the left-hand side. What are my options here for moving forward? Well, what's one option for moving forward? Just looking for ideas here. No, it doesn't have to be the right thing. Sometimes we can try something wrong, and that's fine. We just go back. Can we use Pythagorean identities on the right side? Yeah, you can use Pythagorean identities on the right side. And in fact, you can use a Pythagorean identity on the left side, too. 1 minus sine squared of x, because you have sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, right? So if you moved the sine over, you'd have that that is equal to cosine squared. So yeah, Pythagorean identities. I see the, t the clue for me to use I Pythagorean identities is I have things like 1 and something squared. You know there's going to be a Pythagorean identity available there. So let's review what they are. So we already said if sine squared was over here as a minus, then that would be cosine squared. And the other one that's going to be relevant is 1 plus tan squared of x is secant squared of x. 1 plus tan squared of x is secant squared of x. So let's rewrite using those identities here. So what are we going to get on the left side? We have 2 sine of x on top. And on bottom, what do I write? Cosine squared of x. Yeah, cosine squared of x. Now how about the right hand side? I am going to replace tan squared of x plus 1 with secant squared of x. And then I'm going to add that to secant squared of x. So I should have 2 secant squared of x over cosecant squared of x. OK, so. I've made quite a bit of prog. Is it cosecant squared? No, it's just cosecant. <coughs> Sorry. So I've made quite a bit of progress. This, this is looking like it's in much better shape now. But I still can't really see why this should be true. Any other techniques that I could apply here? Um, I can't. Well, I could on both sides if I flip both sides, but that would be sort of a lateral move, I, and I want to move forward. Let me ask you another question. Which side do you not like? We don't like the right side. Why do we not like the right side? Yeah, because it's secant and cosecant. Those functions are annoying, right? So what does that lead us to think maybe we should do? Yeah, re maybe rewrite on the right side? Because we, we can rewrite the right side in terms of sine and cosine, right? That was one of those methods we just talked about at the start of class, right? So let's do that.
Okay, so secant squared of x, I can rewrite as secant is 1 over what? It's 1 over cosine. So this is 1 over cosine squared. And cosecant is what? 1 over sine. <coughs> and hopefully when you see this, you're thinking now, oh, this is probably going to be true. Yes, this is probably going to be true. Because I can rewrite the top as 2 over cosine squared of x. And if you divide by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, right? So at the end, I'm going to get, oops, I'm going to get 2 sine of x divided by cosine squared of x, right? OK, that was kind of an elaborate procedure there. But the idea is, look, dividing by 1 over sine is the same as multiplying by sine over 1. Yes? So the numerators get multiplied. That's how we get 2 sine x. The denominators get multiplied. That's how I get cosine squared x. And I can stop now. Okay, I can stop now because this is clearly true. So we didn't reduce it to an identity which is known, but we reduced it to an equality that is just immediately by inspection must be true, right? You have the same exact thing on both sides. Does that make sense? OK, so therefore, we can follow the green line of truth. So this is true. So I'm going to follow the green line of truth, which says that this must also be true. And therefore, this is also true. And therefore, this is also true. And therefore, this is also true. And therefore, this is true. And therefore, our original expression is true, OK? Because all of these equations are like saying the same thing in different languages, right? If I say a statement in Spanish or in French or in English, doesn't change whether the statement is true or false. Yes? Doesn't change whether the statement is true or false. So I just translate this through many different languages until I get into a language that I'm familiar with. And I say, aha, I know that's definitely true in that language. So it must be true in all the others. Yeah? Can you just go over the last part again? Like, how do you get 2 over cosine to How do you get the answer out of this? Yeah, like, how do you simplify it? How do I simplify this? So if you take a fraction and divide it by another fraction, um, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by a reciprocal. So this is 2 over cosine squared of x times one, uh, sine x over 1. OK, so after a while, you will start to have a feeling of when you see something which is kind of ripe for a certain technique, OK? So when I look at this, I say, well, this is r sort of ripe for finding a common denominator because when I do that common denominator, I know that when I multiply 1 minus sine times 1 plus sine, I'm going to get 1 minus sine squared. And I, the reason I know that this is kind of ripe for that is because that's going to give me 1 minus sine squared, which I already know is going to be able to be transformed into cosine squared. So after a while, you start to have this kind of foresight about where things are going. And also, immediately, there's a huge hint on the right-hand side. I've got tan squared of x plus 1. And also some other like secant and cosecant. I have a lot of different ways I can attack this by transforming things into sine and cosine uh, or whatever. And this is by no means 
the best way to solve this. Okay, you could have started by saying I'm going to replace secant by you know one over cosine or whatever, and I'm going to replace cosecant by one over sine, and then just start started there and simplified the right hand side. That probably could have worked too. So you have a lot of freedom. Here, which is why I recommend you to become comfortable with just choosing a direction and going with it and seeing if it can work out. And if it doesn't work out, you can always go back to the beginning and start again. Okay, there's no sunk costs. All right. Okay, so with that, let's do a partner practice. We're going to work on two problems with a partner, okay? The first one is a disprove, okay? A disprove. So we have to disprove the fact that sine plus cosine is always 1. And then I'd also like you to verify this identity shown here. Can everyone read those? My handwriting is not great. i make it as big as possible. Okay, so go ahead and work with a partner, and I'll, I'll be walking around. I'm going to pass out your quizzes while you work, and uh, just raise your hand if you have any questions. Actually, I still haven't graded yours. Sorry. I'm going to do that soon.
Let's discuss. So, for disproving, what's my main tool for disproving? Plugging in values. If I plug in a value and it's true, is it true? Well, if I plug in a value and it's true, then it's true for that value. But does that mean that the identity will be true for every input? No. So, and when we're disproving, we're in a good scenario. Like the burden on us is very small. We just have to say that it's not true for a single value of x. But you have to pick a good value of x in order to make it uh, not true. So for example, x equals 0. Let's try plugging in x equals 0. I would get sine of 0 plus cosine of 0 is equal to 1. And then this thing is 0, and this thing is 1. So OK, 1 is equal to 1. So have I just proven that this is actually true? No, because what I have shown is that it is true for x equals 0. How about x equals 1 radian, or 2 radians, or 3 radians, or whatever, right? Or pi radians. I haven't shown that it's true. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. It means we found one number for which, if you plug it in, it is true. But that was a fluke. So let's try another one. Let's try x equals pi, or pi over, no, uh, no, not pi over 2. Pi, pi over 2 also wouldn't work. But if we do pi, then we would get sine of pi plus cosine of pi is equal to 1. And this is 0, and this is negative 1. So we get negative 1 equals 1, which is not true. Therefore, this is disproven. We found an x value for which it's not true. And the statement here is to say, look, no matter what x you pick, you add sine x plus cosine x, you get 1. We found one that is not true for, so it can't be true for, quote unquote, every value of x, because there, is, there, is, there exists an x value for which it's not true. So we're done. We've disproven here by plugging in pi. Or you could plug 3 pi over 2, or like pi over 4, pi over 3 would work. What wouldn't work would be something like pi over 2 or 0 because those are the numbers which cause one of these to be 1 and the other to be 0. OK. Any questions on the disproving one? OK, then let's talk about the verification one, because that one I think is more interesting. For the verification one, well, there's a lot of different things that I could start by doing, OK? But loosely speaking, it's usually good to start on what we call the more complicated side. To my eye, the more complicated side is this side here. And what I see 
is a product of a sum and a difference. Now, I think a lot of students struggle when they see something like this. They're, they have a hard time recognizing the form of what's going on here. By form, what I mean is this is a product of a sum and a difference. So you could think of this product in the same way that you think of a product like this. All right? It, this, is a, this is a product of a sum and a difference. And what would I do to simplify something like this? I would use good old FOIL. Okay, If I would use FOIL to simplify something like this, well, this is basically the same thing. The only thing that's different here is we're working with functions instead of x and numbers, right? Instead of variables and numbers, we're working with functions, right? So this tends to give us a hard time because our intuition, we're used to seeing things like this and working on things like this. And this is where we have a lot of practice. But we don't have a lot of practice multiplying functions together like this. So sometimes our wires get a little crossed. But once you can identify that this is just the product of a sum and a difference, you can see immediately that, well, let's FOIL. First is cosine times cosine. That's cosine squared of x. Outside would be cosine times sine. So I get plus, I'm going to write sine x times cosine x because I can do multiplication in any order I want. And then inside would be negative sine x times cosine x. And then last would be minus sine x times sine x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. So what have I done here? I've just foiled. And it looks kind of ugly still on the left-hand side until we realize that this term is the same as this term except negative. So they can cancel each other out. If I add something and then subtract it right away, those cancel with each other, and I am left with cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x is equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of x. And now I'm going to show you three different ways to finish. The first way is going to be add sine squared x to both sides. OK, add sine squared x to both sides. Then I would get cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x. This is a Pythagorean identity. Second would be, OK, so that was the visualization of moving this to this side. The second way would be the visualization of moving this to this side. If I do that, then I would get cosine squared of x. So if I add 2 sine squared of x to both sides, uh, then what could I do? I could uh, have cosine squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1. This is a Pythagorean identity again. I like method number 2 probably the best. Because for me, this is how I'm used to seeing this Pythagorean identity. So I, my, my intention is to put all of the trig functions on one side and the number on the other side. That's what I like to do personally. But if you don't feel the same, that's totally fine. Here's another way I saw it done by Ashley that was kind of clever, I thought, was to say this. Well, we can rewrite the right-hand side. as 1 minus sine squared x minus sine squared x. And then you notice by a Pythagorean identity that this is just cosine squared of x, which tells us that this whole expression really just says cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x is equal to cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x. And why should this be true? Because it's the same exact darn thing on both sides. OK, so three different ways that you could try to tackle uh, this problem. 
But I think the intuition at the start is probably the trickiest part, right? The intuition at the start is the trickiest part. Okay, foiling all of this out, okay? And then when you get to here, what are we really doing? In, step, in method one and method two, all we're doing is what we've been doing since middle school, which is combining like terms, right? The same reason that I would, I, if I were to simplify the equation like x minus 3 equals 3 minus 2x, what would I do? I would collect the numbers together and I would collect the x's together, right? By combining like terms. So the only difference here is instead of x, I've got like sine squared. So this is like has the form minus x, and then this side has like minus 2x, okay? So the way, the way we combine them is just adding them together. We add the coefficients, which the coefficient here is negative 1. The coefficient here is negative 2. Okay, so we just combine like terms. If I have negative 1 of something on this side and negative 2 of that same thing on this side, we can combine them and say we have a total of either positive 1 on this side or negative 1 on the other side. OK, so that was the verification problem. Any questions on that problem? All right, it doesn't seem like there are. So uh, let me briefly introduce the sum and difference formulas. OK, so new section. We're talking about uh, some new identities, OK, new identities, which tell us something about which, by the way, probably don't spend all this time copying all these down. They're in the textbook. Or you can find them on the YouTube video. Or I'll post my notes to, to Blackboard. But what I want you to focus on right now is what I'm telling you, which is there is a relationship between cosine of a sum of two angles and like sine and cosine of the individual angles which are being added, okay, which are being added, okay, or subtracted for cosine or for sine, okay? By the way, you only really need to memorize one and three because if you just say that you can just say that, look, u minus v is just the same as u plus negative v. OK, so if you know the first identity, you can get the second one. And if you know the third identity, you can get the fourth one. But I actually don't want you to memorize these. This is too much to memorize. I don't even keep these memorized. Um, what I do is anytime I have to use one, I am like, oh, yeah, what is that again? And I Google it or <laughs> something like that. Um, if I was going to do it on an exam, probably what I'll end up doing actually is I'll allow you to have a formula sheet for the final exam. Um, so this is the sort of thing I would definitely put on my formula sheet because there's no way in hell that I'm going to remember that. Anyways, cosine of a sum can be written as a difference of cosine of u times cosine of v minus sine of u times sine of v. So let me show you a quick example that was going to be a partner practice. Okay, that was going to be a partner practice, but I want to work on it instead together as a class. So our goal is to find something like this. Sine of 5 pi over 12. Now, when I look at an angle like that, the first thing that I think is that's not going to give me a 30, 60, 90 triangle or a 45, 45, 90 triangle inside the unit circle. So how in the hell am I going to do like sine of 5 pi over 12? That angle is sort of intractable until you realize that this angle can be rewritten as a sum of two angles which we do know how to find sine and cosine of. So if I can rewrite this as a sum, okay, if I can rewrite this as a sum, then I could use, 
identity number 3. So as long as I can write 5 pi over 12 as the sum of two angles for which I know how to do cosine and sine of those angles, then I will be able to do this new angle by using my regular trigonometry skills plus this identity. Those two tools will be enough for me to get the answer. So the first thing I need to do is express 5 pi over 12 in terms of angles that I know how to do trig functions of. So the main ones that I know how to do are like pi over 6, pi over 4, and pi over 3, right? Those are the ones I know how to do. So the hint here says, look, 5 pi over 12 is given by pi over 6, which is a 30 degree angle, plus some other angle. How can I figure out what that is? I can do 5 pi over 12 equals to 2 pi over 12 plus question mark. Therefore, question mark must be equal to 3 pi over 12 because we subtract on both sides. Is there a question? Lauren, yes. you have a question? No, I'm good. You Sorry. good? Okay. Then 3 pi over 12 can, of course, be rewritten as pi over 4. So pi over 6 plus pi over 4 gets us pi, 5 pi over 12. So I can rewrite sine of 5 pi over 12 is the same as sine of pi over 6 plus pi over 4, which is equal to in light of this, what am I going to do? I'm going to put a u everywhere I see a u. I'm going to put a pi over 6. And everywhere I see a v, I'm going to put a pi over 4. So I get sine of pi over 6 times cosine of pi over 4 plus cosine of pi over 6 times sine of pi over 4. OK, that's what the identity told me to do. So let me just, uh, no, that's not what I want to do. OK, I need to move this up first. Then I need to grab this, move it down. OK, so you can think of this like the following. In light of this identity, I can rewrite sine of 5 pi over 12 as the sine of the sum of these two angles, which is just sine of, the, of pi over 6 times cosine of pi over 4 plus cosine of pi over 6 times sine of pi over 4. And if you'll allow me to briefly compute, I think we get 1 half times root 2 over 2 plus cosine of pi over 6 would be root 3 over 2 times root 2 over 2. So I get root 2, I get 1 plus the square root of 3 times root 2 all over 4. All right, great. You're just having to take my word for it that this is this, and this is this, and this is this. OK. So we'll stop there for today, and we will, uh, we will come back to this next time.